Does it ever happen to you that in the middle of a song like that, it dawns on you that what you're singing is real, meaning it's going to happen? I don't, maybe I'm the only one that struggles with that, that sometimes I'm singing about the fact that one day I will be singing in mansions of glory. I don't even really know what that means, but I know that it's real. Does it ever happen to you that you're just singing and then you realize, oh, I'm just singing? No, I'm singing a truth that is real. Whoo. Man, praise God, praise God. A paradox. A paradox is a statement that is a seemingly contradictory statement or opposed to common sense and yet is perhaps true. There are some famous paradoxes out there. There's one called Zeno's Paradox, and it dives into the complexity of if you were to travel from point A to point B, not on a train, not leaving Chicago, but if you were traveling from point A to point B, the notion is you can't get to point B until you've gone halfway, which makes sense, right? Like if I were to have a child come up here and stand at point A and say, all right, I'm point B, for you to get to point B, you'd have to at least come halfway, right? And so Zeno's paradox is saying that when you get to halfway, you then have another segment in which you can only reach by going halfway first. And so if you only move halfway each time, you never actually get to point B. You just get closer and closer to point B, but every time you're going half the distance, and therefore you never actually reach it. And some of you are sitting there going, what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> this is what philosophers do to get paid. Another paradox is a paradox similar of motion. This is called the Fletcher's or the arrow maker's paradox. And this is saying that any given moment of time, an arrow in the air, at one moment of time, it is stationary because an arrow can't be in two places at once. That would mess with our minds. And so at one moment in time, if you would think like a photograph, if you took a photograph of an arrow, in that moment of time, it is not moving, it is stationary. And since time is made up only of infinite moments of time, therefore the arrow never really moves and movement itself is impossible. <laughs> if you're thinking, Daniel, I don't get into anything mathematical, I'll just give you one for the New Year's. Here's one for you. If your New Year's resolution is to break your resolution, would you break it by keeping it? Are you getting that? I love to see the different ways your face contorts when you think through different things. So if my resolution is to break my resolution, if I actually break my resolution, I'm keeping my resolution, so I haven't broken it in the first place. So I'm in a cycle of insanity. There was a World War II novel called Catch-22 in which the author pushed this, that pilots who found themselves in a category of being psychologically unfit would get out of combat duty. And so many men would try and push themselves as psychologically unfit to get out of combat duty. But the um, doctors would say, if you're trying to get out of combat duty, you're actually proving yourself to be psychologically fit because who would want to be in combat duty? Get back in the plane. And then there was a paradox that I came across this week that by Enrico Fermi, scientist, and really if you have a biblical worldview, this isn't a paradox at all, it's just poor reasoning, but this is a famous paradox when it comes to the world of astronomy. You see, in the world of astronomy, we look out and we see in the vast universe many planets that look similar to ours. In other words, the, the common notion or assumption, underlying assumption is that there are lots of Earths. It's relatively common. It's a common type of planet. But then he actually asked this question, well, then where are the people? This is funny. It is. They, they simply say there are a lot of planets like Earth out there. Why don't we see them? Why don't we hear them? Actually, they use the word hear because they, they describe humanity as noisy. Like we have radio frequencies. We have all kinds of things going on that should be detectable, and we don't find any people. Well, paradoxes can be fun or frustrating depending on your goal or even depending on your mindset. Some of you in here get all excited about things like that, and some of you in here don't want anything to do with it. 
But we have a paradox this morning in our text that is crucial. In fact, it is embedded in one of the most significant commands we have in all of Scripture. If you'll open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 12, we are going to look at a paradox for eternity. A paradox that is at the central heart of every follower of Christ. For most of you in here, chapter 12 is likely on the same page, or at least when you open your Bible, it's in the same context as chapter 11. Hopefully, none of you had the chapter break where 11 ended and you have to flip the page to chapter 12. Why? Because chapter 11 really sets chapter 12 up on a T. After 11 chapters of intense teaching, beginning with Paul's incredible confidence in the gospel. Do you remember way back, months and months and months ago, when we talked about Romans 1.16 and that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel? And we say, well, what is the gospel? It's simply the good news of Jesus Christ. And then we find out that the good news has to come with a context, it has to come with bad news. And so we find out that the good news, which comes from God, also we learn the bad news comes from God in that we have rebelled. Mankind, all of us, from Adam on down, have rebelled against our God and King. We have chosen to declare what we think is good and what we think is right, and we have shunned our God, and he is rightly opposed to us. And not only is he opposed to us, but he's in a position to be just what he is, and that is a holy judge. He's in position to execute sentencing on us, and we know from the scriptures that the wages, or we could call it the consequences of sin, is death. And so we all stand under a death sentence. But the glorious gospel, which Paul is so confident in and so um, unashamed of, is the good news that we have an opportunity to have pardon from this sentencing because Christ came and Christ lived as Adam should have lived, right? Perfectly and joyfully, obediently to the Father in every way. And then Christ died as the animal in the garden died in place of Adam. So did Christ die in place of all Adams and Eves. Who would ever put their hope in him? And then he was raised from the dead to validate his claim that this life is not the end, but that we can have eternal life. We can have life without death. We can have life without sin. We can have life without disappointment. This is the good news that over and over again Paul goes to in Romans and says this good news is given to us not by our merit, not by our works, not by our morality, but by faith in Christ and his righteousness. And we come into chapters 9 through 11, and it says not just, the, not just the Gentile and not just the Jew, but all men and women from all tribes, all tongues, and all nations can receive him and can have eternal life with him. And then we walk through those three chapters where we realize that God has, in his great mystery, has worked together this Sort of this dance with the Jewish rebellion as his own people rejected him. And yet he used that to open the door to the other nations. And then he uses the other nations' receipt of the king to bring jealousy to the Jewish nation so that one day he will bring them to saving faith. And so at the end of chapter 11, Paul's mind, like all good theologians, is boggled. Right? Again, we've talked about this over and over again. If your theology doesn't take you to a place where you are blown away by who God is and you are, uh, well, you are discouraged by the finite understanding that you have. In other words, if you don't need Advil in your theology, your theology is not deep enough. Your God is far greater than you can comprehend. And so that's Paul's words. Look at Romans chapter 11. Oh, the depths. This is verse 33, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has been given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Steve Love said that if he was here last week, and he heard that word, that verse read, he might have stood up and shouted. And he said he was glad that he wasn't here because he might have done that. And I want to encourage him, if you need to stand up and shout when Scripture is read, feel free. Okay? Feel free. And if there is a text in which you would ever stand up and shout, is it not this? From him and through him and to him are all things 
How incredible is this? And this really puts this so much, this puts this in front of us. This creates, you can feel the tension of it. If this is who God is, and this is what God has done, then there has to be a response, almost a knee-jerk response, right? Steve, you felt that. You feel this. I want to do something. I want to stand up and shout. And depending on your cultural context, you might start dancing. You might start screaming. You might, who knows, right? And I'm not trying to encourage us to have some sort of lighthearted response to things. But I do want us to understand there is a, there is a natural, a God-given desire to respond when God and his works are put before us. That's what chapter 12 is. That's why, unfortunately, you have a break. And you have that big number, chapter 12, the big numbers are the chapter numbers, that is moving us into another section, which it is. But at the same time, it is so tied to this doxology. It is what drives us. This doxology drives us to the point of response. In fact, Paul is now going to give, if you're sort of scanning or surveying the book of Romans, you will find that the first 11 chapters are largely instructive or what if grammarians would say filled with indicatives. That's statement of truth, statements of truth. There are a few imperatives or commands scattered around, but largely these are just statements of who God is and what he's done. And when you hit chapter 12, the scene changes, and it's full of commands. And this is not unique to Romans. In fact, this is the way that Paul works, and this is the way the scriptures work. God presents truth and tells us to live in light of it. And this is what Paul is going to do for the rest of the book of Romans, is he is going to say, based on what you've read and what you've heard in the first 11 chapters, now this is how we live. So he moves, and this brings us to exhortation. Because the end of all great theology is not knowledge. Please understand that. If you think that you've discovered or you know, come up with a red, I don't mean in a new fit sense, but new to you, you've just, oh, you've this new theology. If you think the end of it, that God designed the end of it, be that you would just have more knowledge, you're shortchanging yourself and God. He has created us to know him so that we can live in light of him, so that we can worship him. And this is what this text will clearly say. Romans 12, let me read for us the first two verses. It's all we're going to get to. And it's enough. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul is going to give us, you'll find there, even if just look, one of the things I'll just tell you in Bible study, it's really helpful for you when you come to a text, especially a text in a letter. In a narrative, it's a little bit different, but in a letter, look for commands. Look for, the, look for the main verb, first off, and then look for any that are commands. And we're going to find three of them in these two verses. Three commands, and the first one is the header. The first one is the overarching command, and the second two support it. The first command, he starts with this phrase, and he says, I appeal to you. And really, that's even not strong enough a translation of this word. Some of you may have urge or um, beseech. That's a good word that you probably used zero times this week. Uh, if you're a parent in here and you said to your child, I beseech you, you need to tell me this week and I'll go buy you a milkshake because that's just, I'm impressed. <laughs> I, I urge you, I beg you, I plead with you, I exhort you. This is what Paul is saying, right? And then before he can give the actual command, which is to present your bodies, notice what he does. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, therefore, it's tying us all the way back, right, in chapter 11 and everything before it. I appeal to you, therefore, based on all these things, by the mercies of God, in light of what God has done. Remember? In light of what God's mercy has been before us. And if you think about these, I love to think about the phrase, we talk about manifold mercies or multiplied mercies or how many, sometimes you even reference from Lamentations, new every morning. 
We sing a song that talks about how our sins are many, but his mercy is what? More. That's the overwhelming understanding of truth is that our sins are all over the place and yet his mercy is more. In light of his mercies toward us, and we've already seen incredible mercies in the text, the fact that we are doomed in our sin, we were dead in our sin, and he made us alive together with Christ. In light of this mercy, here's the exhortation. Present your bodies or your whole selves as a living sacrifice. There's our paradox. There's our paradox, a living sacrifice. If you've waited in biblical waters long, you're familiar with the idea of a sacrifice. You know from the very beginning in Genesis 3 that Adam and Eve were told that if you do these things, you will die. You will surely die. And yet, Adam and Eve didn't die immediately, but an animal died, and they were covered. So from the very beginning, there was an idea that there could be death in place of someone else. And the idea and the concept of sacrifice began. And we see sacrifices instituted in the nation of Israel. They would would regularly bring animals and, and kill them as a sacrifice. And they filled it. Guilt offerings when one had sinned, or thanks offerings after they'd been blessed. And formal worship was often centered around a sacrifice where an animal was offered to God and its life ended. And we saw the climax of sacrificing in Christ. Now, on a side note, we were having a discussion with a couple of us who were in a little baptism class talking this morning, and I made them comment that Baptism wasn't instituted with Jesus when he came on the scene, right? Even John the Baptist was already baptizing, and there was a whole culture of baptism before that. And I made the phrase, well, Jesus hijacked that baptism and made it his own in a similar fashion to the way he hijacked the Passover and made the Lord's Supper his own. And then, it, you know, it's a good reminder to, to note, no, wait, this is the sovereign God of the universe, who didn't stumble across John the baptizer, baptizing and go, oh, that's a cool idea. He created John the Baptist before the foundation of the earth. He didn't stumble across a group of people that were celebrating Passover and go, that's a cool idea. I can tweak that. He created the first Passover. He ordained all of these things. So when we come to John the Baptist declaring, behold, the Lamb of God who comes away to take away the sin of the world and sacrifice is now seen in Christ. It's not a cool, creative thing how he took a practice and tweaked it to be Christ. He instituted sacrifices in the beginning so that they could culminate in Christ. So that the author of Hebrews can say, friends, have we not seen that the blood of bulls and goats does not take away the sin of man? Have we not seen that? We have to kill animals over and over and over again. But when Christ came... He died once and for all. His sacrifice was final. How glorious. His sacrifice was final. So we don't offer sacrifices that die anymore. We offer sacrifices that live. This is the paradox. Sacrifices don't stay alive. That's that's the whole point. Right? You don't take a lamb in to be sacrificed. If the lamb runs away, the sacrifice failed. Right? If he slips out and he's got some moves and he breaks some ankles and he's gone, the sacrifice didn't happen. When a lamb goes in to be sacrificed, he dies. So a living sacrifice is this paradox, and yet it's what we're called to be. What is a living sacrifice? Maybe you think of the words that Jesus gave to his disciples in Luke chapter 9 when he said this, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his what? Cross. Now for us, that's probably a symbol. You may have it hanging from your ear or around your neck right now or tattooed on your arm. Right? It's a symbol of salvation and grace and faith. And... But what is a cross? It's a tool of execution. It's a symbol of death. And so Jesus says, I want you to take up your cross daily and follow me. Now I want to pause right here because you could be saying, well, maybe is that just a, that we need to be willing to die for Jesus? And I would say, yes, 
That is a true statement. And in fact, I think many times in American Christianity, we, are, we don't put the option out there or we don't encourage one another enough to say, are we willing to go to Afghanistan with the gospel? Are we willing to die for Christ? And some of you may be sitting here going, well, if it, if it happens here, then I'll, I'll have to be willing. And yes, you will. And yes, it might come. But are we willing to go and die for Christ? Are we willing to pick up our cross daily and follow him? But that's not really the core of what this means. That's one practical application. Because what does he say? Pick up the cross daily. Well, if you go to Afghanistan and preach on the street corner and you're killed, you're not picking up a cross the next day. Right? You're picking up a crown. What does it mean? To take up your cross daily, it means to die to self. To die to self. He says, for whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses and forfeits himself? Friends, this is crucial. We we cannot miss this. Christianity is not adding Jesus to our life. Christianity is saying to Jesus, my life is died. It's dead. My life is now you. My hopes, my dreams, my aspirations, all of that, all of those died. Now what I don't mean here, because here's what can happen. Here's what Satan immediately would do with that. If I look at you and say, to live as Christ means that you need to take your dreams and hopes and aspirations and you need to put them on an altar and say, they are dead to me, Satan will go, ah, yeah, your king is a killjoy. Think about all those good dreams you had. Think about the musical talent he's given you and you had dreams of using it. Think about your education or this job or this career that you wanted to have. God's gonna take that from you. If you wanna follow Christ, he's gonna take away all those good desires. Let me tell you something. Satan has not changed what he did in the garden. He is telling you a lie. Because the psalmist said this, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now be careful. Be careful what we can do with that, right? Is to say, well, I desire, I'd like one of those big mansions now. My car's having some problems. I'd really like my car not to ever have problems. I'd like a new car. I'd like a new job. I'd like, you know, whatever. You name it. A boat. Membership to a golf course. I don't know what it is. If I delight myself in the Lord, he's going to give me those desires. That's not what that means. What that means is when you delight yourself in the Lord, he's going to look at your shallow desires that won't satisfy you, that would leave you at the end of them going, why on earth did I get a golf membership? Golf is a terrible game. We played it yesterday for nine holes, and I do think it's from Satan. (laughs) Because I'm addicted to it. Like, you know, it's like it feels like sin. You're drawn back to it. You do it. You're not satisfied. You're angry. You throw things. It's just not pleasant. God knows that our desires are too small. And when we delight ourselves in him, he gives us the desires that we were created to have, which are far bigger and far greater. When we say to our shallow, it's not, now understand this, we're saying to the sovereign God of the universe, let's say, let's say I was a fantastic uh, piano player. Let's say I was, I am not. Let's say I was a fantastic piano player and it was my dream to play my piano in front of all kinds of people. But I come to Christ and I say, my dreams are dead. I put them before you to live as Christ. You're saying the sovereign good God of the universe can't take the talent he gave me in the first place and put me on stage if that's what's best? Don't listen to Satan. Our lives are to be dead. So, because our lives are dead. And our dreams and our hopes are too shallow. But to live to Christ is satisfaction and joy and contentment. What are we supposed to do in reaction to the fact that God, look at the end of that doxology. Remember, this is what drives us to present ourselves as living sacrifices. Why? Because from him and through him and to him are all things. Whatever you've been given, whatever hopes and dreams and talents and resources you've been given are to him. And friends, when we use them to him, we find our greatest joy. 
John Piper is not wrong when, we find, when he says that we find our greatest joy in glorifying him. When God is um, most glorified in us, when we are most satisfied in him, we find satisfaction in God's glory. The scriptures are not telling us to lay aside our pursuit of satisfaction. It is telling us, don't chase after the things that won't satisfy, find them in God. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. When we live to Christ, we take full advantage of what God has for us and we build dreams in heaven like we can't possibly imagine here. Look back at the text. He continues to describe what this living sacrifice looks like. He says it's holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It's holy. Uh, Well, of course it's holy. It's set apart. That's what that word means. Set apart. Remember how the Jewish people were set apart physically? God wanted to, to make them, put them on display so that when he took them out of Egypt miraculously, when he won victorious battles for them, when he put himself on display, he wanted to do it through a people that were conspicuously his, so he made them look really, really different. Right? They had to do different things with their hair. They had to wear different clothing. They, they had to eat different foods. They had to be completely set apart. Oh, we're to be just as, if not more so, distinct, not through what we wear and what we do with our hair, but how we live, how we love, how we demonstrate Christ's likeness on this earth. He says it's holy, it's set apart. He says it's acceptable. And friends, we know that our worship is only acceptable because it comes through Christ We're only able to die to ourselves and live to him because of Christ, and it is through him that our worship is accepted, flawed and finite as it is. And then he calls it, unfortunately in my text, I think this is not the best translation, he says, which is your spiritual worship. If you look at other texts that use this word, it's translated different, it'd be translated reasonable or logical worship. Some of you may even have that in your translation, and I think this makes sense. Because this is saying, if God has done what he has done for you, it is reasonable that this is how you would live. Like, this is how you worship him. If this is what God has done for you, it is reasonable that you don't just go and kill a dove and walk away with your own life. That your worship is not just some sort of external offering, but it is your life. If what God has done for you, if you truly were dead in your trespasses and sin, if you had no hope apart from Christ in this world and he made you alive together with Christ, if that is true, then it is right and reasonable that your worship would be all of you. The right response in light of what we have read chapters 1 through 11 would be to worship with our lives. That's why Ephesians is is similarly structured to Romans. The first three chapters are just full of indicatives, right? Full of indicatives that we were dead, we were, um, you know, sons and daughters of disobedience. We were children of wrath, but Christ made us alive. And then Ephesians 4 turns the corner in the same way that chapter 12 turns the corner, and it says this, therefore, walk worthy. Walk in a manner that is fitting or reasonable or appropriate. Live life in light of what Christ has done. Isaac Watts penned one of the most memorable hymns. I mean, it's still being sung today. I mean, he wrote thousands of hymns. And he started when he was five, so it's always good when God humbles. If you you struggle with pride, read biographies too. Read the scriptures and read church history. And you realize, oh, yeah, I'm not, ah, I'm not that special. But anyway, all right. And even people who are special, God made them this way, right? So to God be the glory for Isaac Watts. But he wrote these words. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour content on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God, All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. And then he closes with this line, Were the whole realm of nature mine, if I had everything at my disposal, 
that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. But here's the beautiful paradox of this demand is that it's delightful. I mean, we're going to have a cookout later this afternoon. And if I told a couple of you in here, okay, I'm going to give you a task, and I'm going to, you're going to have to go up to people, and you're going to have to tell them what to do. All right? But this is what you're going to tell them. You're going to walk up to people and go, go to the front of the line and eat as much as you want. Now, if you receive that command, is that rough? Right? You've received a command for your own delight. That is what we have here in the scriptures. You're being told to feast. You're being told to lay aside these earthly, rusty, uh, unimpressive things and to feast and rejoice in Christ for all eternity. So yes, his work demands my life, my soul, my all. But friends, when I give my life, my soul, my all in return, I get all that I was created to have. How does this all take place? Keep looking at the text. Look back, verse 2. He says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So here are the next two commands. And they're really like, it's as if it's a double-edged sword. They're used together. But the first one says, do not be conformed. Here's another challenge in the life of a believer, a bit of a paradox in the life of a believer, because we have some exhortations in Scripture that say things like this. Paul says, well, I became all things to all men so that by some measure I might save some. So there's a sense in which Paul conformed some of his life for the glory of God. But then we read text that says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And we're called to be holy, for he is holy. And so we're called to be set apart. So we have this tension. What does it mean? And we know that we are called not to be conformed to this world, to be like this world. But what does it mean then? How are we to be in the world but not of the world? How do we handle this? If we're not merely adding Jesus to our lives or sort of running him through, running our lives through this holy filter, what does it mean that we are to not conform to this world? It means that we are to be distinct. He is to be our Lord. He is to be the driving force in why we are what we are and how we look and live the way we live. So Paul did not eat like a Gentile or dress like a Gentile so he could be cool to the Gentiles. He ate like a Gentile or ate like a Jew for the glory of God. So when we look at our conforming to the world, we need to ask ourselves, why am I being like the world? Am I being like the world in this sense to truly reach the world, or am I being like the world because I think the world is offering me something better than God is? Some places we need to understand, because Satan is very good at this. We need to be very careful, because being conformed to the world also has, it not only has sort of this licentious warning to not be, or to not be licentious, to not follow your sin into the streets of Vegas. It also warns you from the halls of Rome. It keeps you and says, don't be conformed in self-righteousness. Because there's part of the world that attacks and goes after the claims and, and purposes of Christ through blatant sin. And there's part of the world that goes after and rejects and mars the image of Christ through Self-righteousness, which is just sin in a different coat, right? It's just sin with a tie on it, that's all. Now, it isn't easy to always determine this. It isn't easy. And so what's the second command that comes along with this? Do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I want you to pay special attention to this. There's not a third option. Did you see that? 
I mean, you can raise your hand if you have one in your text, but in my Bible, it says this, don't be conformed, be transformed. Seems like there's only options. You're either being conformed or you're being transformed. Do you see that? That's what I see. Now, we've used the illustration before because the Apostle Paul's used the illustration before where he likens pursuing godliness to pursuing physical health and strength and vitality. And it's a really helpful one because you need to understand the same is true. When you're getting in shape or whatever, there's no neutral. Some of you in here realize that. You're old enough to realize that. Some of you in here, you're young and you think, well, it's just neutral. That's not life. You're just still growing up. Once you hit being a man or a woman, there's no more neutral. In fact, some of you are sitting there going, do you know how much time I've spent just to maintain? Right? Because if you're not doing something to make your body better, you're making your body worse. Do you understand that? If you're not strengthening your body, you're weakening your body. That's it. It's like driving a stick shift on a hill. You're either going up or you're going down, right? There's no, you let off the brake. That's, just the, that's the challenge of everybody learning to drive a stick. You're either going forward or you're going backwards, and that's it. And that's the, that's the truth with following Christ. We are either transforming our mind or we are being conformed. Period. Don't fool yourselves. Don't let Satan sort of whisper in your ear that you can kind of look at how far you've transformed your mind, look at how far you've gone, now you can coast. Remember, let's say everybody in here worked their tails off in the gym until December 31st. And then we said, you know what, let's just take 2022 off. Let's just not do anything. What would we look like at the end of the year, right? right? We understand that physically, it's even more so spiritually. You have to work out just to maintain. And we're not called to maintain. We're called to move forward, to progress. Friends, coasting Christians are struggling Christians. We must be active. But how? Look at the text. Renewing of your mind. I love this. And this is repeated over and over through the scriptures. Ephesians 4, 23, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Colossians 3, 10, and to put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Philippians 2, 5, he says this, have this mind among yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. I was reading that and it just took me back to Psalm 1, a very familiar psalm that says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the seat of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is what? In the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night. And when he does that, he's like a tree that's planted by living streams of water. He's not shaken, he's strong, he's stable. He's not like the shaft that's just a gust of wind comes and he's blown away. How are we to renew our minds? We are to be in God's word. Over and over and over again. Now, understand this, that what we're going to find in chapter 12 moving forward is a reversal of what we saw in chapter 1. So chapter 1 described what humanity is like when they reject God. And he says he gives them over to a debased mind. And now in chapter 12, he's calling us to renew our mind to be like Christ. And in so doing, the text says, if you look back, it says, by doing this, by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In contrast to, that, to the Adam of Romans 1 who ignored the will of God and went on his own way, here the believer is saying, I want to live in a way that honors God. How do I do that? You need to be in the word. Friends, do not think because you know some scripture that you are set and your trajectory is good. You need to know the word. Satan will work on you and work on you. You want to, to be able to discern what is right and what is good and what is perfect, be in the word. Have your mind, this, this verb is an idea of continual renewing. Do not let up. Renew your mind. It will expose the lie of Satan because Satan is going to just continually come at you and say, God is not God and God is not good. Be very, very careful if you're declaring what you think God's will is and you have not been soaked in God's word. But instead, let us have the waters of truth poured into us so that we can have the mind of Christ and live our lives in a way that is worshipful to him. 
In that sense, it's simple, friends. What do we do? In light of what Christ has done, we fill our lives with his word and his truth, and then we say to him, here is our life. What do you want us to do with it? And this command is ongoing each and every day, a living sacrifice. We wake up in the morning, we die to self, we recognize our Lord is on the throne, and we joyfully follow him. How freeing that is. Do you, do you at least see that right now? How freeing is it to say, I know why I'm here. I know when I wake up in the morning, regardless. Think about even just in this small crowd, think about how varied our obligations and sort of our short-term goals are for each day. Right? I wake up this morning and I've got to go build a shed for somebody. I'm working to build a shed for someone. Or I'm going and I've got to go you know, do someone's taxes. I'm going to What if something happens? What if I get botched? What if I get fired? What what is your purpose here in life? Your purpose here in life is to present yourself as a living sacrifice. So if he puts you in a palace, praise God. If he puts you in a prison, you keep singing because your purpose is not thwarted by circumstances. Do you understand that? We need to have a great balance, friends, of understanding we are called to live a life that honors God. And we are not threatened when God changes that direction of what it looks like. If circumstances today, and granted, circumstances are weird in our culture. Now, we're so arrogant that we think they're really weird because we haven't been in Afghanistan this month. We're so weird because we haven't lived in Uganda or in Jordan or where our missionaries right now. We're so consumed with a life that, yes, still has the drippings of a Christian land, right? We still get to embrace some of those things. Yes, I get it. We're in a place that is weird and bizarre and uncomfortable. And it's under the sovereign hand of God. Are you ready to present your life as a living sacrifice if one day that means people are trying to figure out a way to rescue you? Do we believe what we've read Do we believe what the scripture says is true? Do we believe this life is a vapor? Do we believe that laying down our lives now gives us all the joys of eternity? Friends, may we pray for one another that we would simply do this. We would present our bodies as a living sacrifice to our king. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I think every every preacher or teacher of God's word knows the futility you often feel when you finish and you recognize that you are not capable of communicating in a way that is worthy, fully worthy of the text. And so, Lord, you've comforted us by telling us that your word is living and active. And so we pray that any words that were said in this service or sung in this service that don't match with your truth, that they would be quickly forgotten. And we pray that your word would be impressed on our hearts. We pray that your words, like present your bodies as a living sacrifice, would, be, would just be burned into us. Because, Lord, your word is truth, and that is how we're sanctified, and that is how we're satisfied. So do that work. Take your word, your glorious word, and move in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.